We're looking now at a movement that would really come to define fine art photography in America in the 20th century, what they called straight photography, that came from a group of photographers that called themselves the F64 group. Now to back up a little bit, here's a photograph that represents what fine art photography meant around the turn of the century. So, uh, so remember that uh, pictorialism put itself in contrast to vernacular photography that was rising at the time. Okay, at the turn of the century in vernacular photography, people were collecting box cameras. They got really inexpensive. Photography was everywhere. People were taking snapshots. In pictorialism, there were these careful, elaborately staged photographs that uh, often used gum bichromate and other, um, other processes that made them look very painterly or like something that was handmade. Okay, so this is a photograph that really is in the pictorialist tradition, photographed by Imogen Cunningham. Now contrast that to, uh, to this photograph. This is from a few years later, 1925, and this represents how photography had changed its perspective on what modern meant by that time. So thinking back to camera work, remember how Alfred, Alfred Stiglitz was stro so strongly influenced by Paul Strand and his bold modern approaches to composition. Okay, so Alfred Stiglitz then by, by turn had his influence on other photographers across the country, and then this new movement arises. So two different uh, visual styles from the same photographer. These are both by Imogen Cunningham. And you can see uh, um, once she has turned to this straight photography style, she's using that, uh, that strategic compositional approach that values sharp detail and gets very close to its subject and, uh, and, and has a, a formalist approach to the photograph. So what do we mean by F64? Well, the F64 aesthetic is often referred to as straight photography. And in this F64 movement, they valued pre-visualization, sharp focus, precise composition, a full tonal scale, and a generally aesthetic approach to the world. We'll look at a lot of examples for this. Ansel Adams would become probably on a popular culture level the most famous of the F64 photographers and this approach to photography that valued all of those things would become the dominant way of, uh, of thinking about fine art photography for the years that would follow. So this F64 group was an actual group of photographers, the most famous of them being the three Ansel Adams, Edward Weston, and Imogen Cunningham. And there were others, but those were the most prominent. <clears throat> um, the name F64 refers to the smallest available aperture for the camera at the time that they were working. And that signaled the group's conviction that photographs should celebrate rather than disguise the medium's unrivaled capacity to present the world as it is. So let's pause for a second to consider what that F64 really means. Um, the photograph on the right shows Edward Weston with one of the kinds of cameras that uh, the, the F64 group used. Okay, this is a view camera, very large sheet of film, and a pretty big lens. Now, F, the, the f-stops uh, are a way of measuring um, apertures, and the higher the number, the smaller the aperture. It's a fraction. So 64, uh, the f64 is a very, very, very small aperture. So you can see in these, uh, in these illustrations, in the diagram on the left, the larger the aperture, the shallower the depth of field, and the more of your picture is going to be out of focus. Well, the F64 photographers wanted everything in their photographs to be in super, super sharp focus, so they were using the smallest aperture that was available to their cameras at the time. It's very, very small. Um, and, uh, and since they wanted everything to be in sharp focus, that, well, that means that you have to have a very long exposure because the small aperture means that very little light is actually getting into that camera and exposing that film. So long, long exposures, and they typically worked in broad daylight to get as much light as possible. And that helps to reduce the exposure time somewhat, but there's still very long exposures.
So about Edward Weston, now he was known for bold, elegant, abstracted images, often drawn from surprising subjects. He was strongly inspired by Alfred Stiglitz. He was based in Southern California, and he also worked in Mexico. So Edward Weston was the leading public face of the F-64 group and all the ideology that they espoused. He wrote, he gave interviews, he was a, he, he was a, a well-known public figure. This is probably Edward Weston's most famous photograph. It's Pepper Number 30 from 1930. Uh, looking at it for the first time, you might be surprised to realize that it is a pepper, just a vegetable, because it's so abstracted. It's, it's so far removed from the way we experience things in daily life. This photograph took a long time for Edward Weston to, uh, to achieve. Um, I'm going to read you from his day books. He, he kept journals of his photography and he wrote about this photograph. He said, I could wait no longer to print them, my new peppers. I put aside several orders and yesterday afternoon had an exciting time with seven new negatives. First I printed my favorite, just as the light was failing, quickly made but with a week's previous effort, back of my immediate unhesitating decision. A week, yes, on this certain pepper, but 28 years of effort, starting with a youth on a farm in Michigan, and he continues, he goes on from then talking about his whole background in photography, but then he goes back to this pepper and says it's a classic, completely satisfying. A pepper, but more than a pepper. Abstract in that it is completely outside subject matter. This new pepper takes one beyond the world we know in the conscious mind. So yes, Edward Weston took the capacity of the photograph very seriously in its capacity to, take, to, to give us a visual experience that's really different and, uh, and for his, in his eye, transcendent, uh, different from the way we would experience life in the world. The photograph can give us something else. These are some of the other photographs that he made of peppers, and you can see how they take us far beyond the world of what a simple vegetable would be if we were just holding it in our hands. It's, a, it's, a, it's an abstract experience. It's an experience of the senses, and for him, leads us to contemplate and possibly take in something more. So the kind of aesthetic experience we get from his photographs is different from what you would experience in real life. Um, he, uh, he spoke of his ideals to record the quintessence of the object or element before my lens, rather than an interpretation, a superficial phase, or passing mood. This is my way in photography. So he feels like he is, through his medium, attaining something like the essence of the thing that takes us beyond our experience of daily life. Edward Weston's photographs of the landscape are, uh, are motivated by those same ideals, um, being able to somehow, through the medium, in capturing the most precise detail, um, to, to give us an experience that takes us um, to something deeper, something beyond what we could experience in daily life. And that approach to capturing his subject material in all of its precise detail and, uh, and, and elegant approach to form, he took that approach to the human body as well. So he did a lot of figure studies. His figure studies treated the human form in a way that is sculptural and that is mo motivated by light texture, surface, and a sort of experience that we will get of the, from the composition that's, a, that's different from a kind of what we would think of as a human connection. This is a, this is a really uh, a formalist approach to the body.